We have a taker. <laughs> Oh, that better way to handle that, but I want to get to know who's, who's, who's hurting this morning, you know? Who's doing that? So that's good. And we should do those things. Because it's the opportunity to pray for somebody that has to wear one of those, right? This was kind of a, an interesting uh, uh, <laughs> an interesting text this morning that we run across on the first Sunday of Advent when we're talking about wisdom. And, and I don't know if you agree or not, it says, and uh, so now uh, one woman has married each uh, of seven brothers. Who will she be married to in heaven? And, of course, talking to this Jesus-like person, it says, think spirit, man. Spirit of law, true. You're, uh, spirit doesn't have marriage. It's marriage. Uh, Hang on. <laughs> it is Mary. Besides, after suffering that much, you think that was the punisher of any brother? <laughs> Dan and I was talking. We went, we went for a long walk, and, we, and, I, and I said, you know, what do you think about that text, you know, about, you know, and, and, and seven brothers and all that? And, and I said something about, you know, why? You know, I don't like it all because I wouldn't want to do that to you. She said, well, I wouldn't want to do that to your brother. <laughs> I wouldn't go in there. It's an interesting text. If we try to marry this text, though, with wisdom. With wisdom. And so, we're, we, you know, as we start this Sunday, one of the names for Jesus that we, attend, that we gave this morning was wisdom. And we asked for that wisdom to come. And so that uh, we, we think about different ways that the Bible talks about wisdom. We could certainly go to Proverbs because much is said in Proverbs when we talk about wisdom. Proverbs 16, uh, 16 says that, that wisdom is more to be cherished than gold and more to be, and knowledge more to be sought after than silver, right? And so we start thinking about how valuable this wisdom is. In the book of John, it says, starts off that, that in the beginning was the Word. The Word is Logos. In the beginning was the Logos, the Word of God, and the Word was, was with God, and the Word was God. And if you take that out of the Greek, the Greek word can go either way. The male version is Logo, uh, Logos, is Word. The female version is Sophia, Wisdom. So you can just as easily change that text. And, and it would still make the most perfect sense to say in the beginning was wisdom. The mind of God thought of this. And Jesus was part of the mind of God. So when we speak about wisdom, it's been around for a long time. And the Stoics picked up on this. And, and we thought, and, and, and the Greeks, the Greeks were just, you know, that we get a lot of our uh Platonic thought from the Greeks and, and uh, the Aristotle, we you know about the philosophical cultures that went there, all of them trying to seek wisdom and more knowledge and keep getting themselves closer and closer and closer to God. Exactly. The more wisdom you have, the more knowledge to have, the closer you are to what the serpent told Eve. Why not be careful? Because he knows that that time that if you eat this apple of knowing good from evil, that you'll know uh, as much as God does. And once that happens, then you won't be God anymore. So we can, we can tie all this together throughout the, the Old Testament and New and start to see how important this bite is, uh, this piece of, 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 uh, of information that we have today called wisdom. Wisdom. In the Gospel of Luke, you know, where we're at this morning, uh, one, one last thought on wisdom. What's it, how's the serenity prayer go that God grant me the courage to, yeah, or the serenity to uh, accept the things I can't change, the courage to change the things I can, and uh, <laughs> to know the difference? Yeah. I'm going to leave you with, we're going to go off with wisdom for a while, but I'm going to leave you with that thought before we go. So, um, as, we, as we move forward and we talk about this Luke text today, this story of seven wives and all that, I want to know, how many did this parable, this story that Jesus told them, 
or, or the, the question about from the, from the Sadducees about the resurrection, how many of this kind of caused you a little bit of angst in your relationships with, uh, uh, yeah, about your, your wedded self and all that and what you expect in the hereafter, you know? No? Everybody just don't take that doesn't matter anyway? Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad to hear you say that, and I'm glad to hear you say that for a couple different reasons, and the big one is the one we're going to get to. Because at the very end, I mean, the end is, is, is exactly what it's for. And uh, there was two groups of people, that, that three groups mentioned there. They had the, the, the Sanhedrin, who was made up of the Sadducees, the Pharisees, and uh, the, the chief priests and the elders. They were all together, so you got the politicians, you got the, the, the church and state, and then you've got these uh, wise folks that's there and, and the controlling parties telling everybody else how to feel. But the Sadducees are the ones who said there's no resurrection because they only took authority from the first five books of the Torah. Anything that went outside the Torah didn't go. And the Torah doesn't mention anything about resurrection. Nothing there. Well, nothing that they saw. There may have been something that Jesus saw that they did not say. So anyway, now, remember in Bible study how you remember which one Pharisees, which one believed in the resurrection and which one didn't? You remember that? You know, because we tell the story again, so I want you to get it right. So I was reading this today and I started laughing because I remember this from, from where I was in, in uh, uh, Bible study as a young person because, you know, the Sadducees are the ones who didn't believe in the resurrection and so they were sad. You see. Yeah, yeah. Oh, come on. It is, it is, you know. Okay, so we're not going to go there anyway. I was told in my preaching to use more humor, and I thought that would be better. That's okay. Playing games with Jesus. So the Sadducees are there, and, and they're the ones who do not believe in the resurrection. Jesus, on the other hand, Pretty much he squared away with it, right? What does Luke 14, 14 tell us? Luke 14, 14, and, and they've already been there, and you will be blessed. Talks about that when you throw a party, don't just invite your friends and everybody else that's going to tell you how good you are. Invite those who can't afford it. Invite those people that, that you would never invite. Invite those strangers, people that never get a meal like that and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. Many times, many times, we don't have to look very far. We know that John, in John's Gospel, I'm going to prepare a place for you that where I am, you will also be. But Jesus has got some more to say about that. He's got some more right now in Mark's Gospel. Jesus is in trouble mostly because he has interpreted uh, what they believe and said, you're the one that don't, don't, that don't really understand what God has written in the, in the Bible. And he'd have been okay if he'd have stayed up north in Galilee where he was going around healing this and, 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 and freeing this and, and doing all of his ministries around God, teaching and, and walking people into the kingdom. He made a bad mistake though, didn't he? With Jerusalem. Now he's in a district, di different district under a different authority, and the people have to, we've got to respond to this character. I mean, look at it. So Jesus comes to Jerusalem, goes into the temple, and did he go there the first time in Luke's gospel to pray? No, he went there and kicked the tables over. Stirred it up. Drew a crowd. Embarrassed folks. Kind of got in their stuff, you know? You know how that is when somebody new from out of town comes in? And kind of walks through the door and all of a sudden says, there's a new person in town and I'm going to change things around. And I know that you thought about this and this is what you believe, but let me show you a different way over here. And so this, the, the, the uh, Sadducee, do you think they cared one, one little bit about the resurrection? No. So why are they asking him this question? Of course, to get him to say something so that they, they can arrest him and, 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 and Luke tells us very clearly so they could put him to death. The whole reason for this conversation about the resurrection isn't because that they really want to hear what Jesus has to say about the resurrection. Give us some good stuff. 
No, so they say something that goes against their law, so they can have him arrested and let, let the Romans put him to death. So anyway, but it, it goes further than that, because Jesus knows what their heart is, and it's no big deal. He knows he can play their silly games. You want to talk about the resurrection and who's, who's, whose life is it in the resurrection? And he just tells them, you know, that you don't understand what this resurrection is. In a little while, after you do put me to death, if you'll pay attention, you'll see. You'll see. You'll get it figured out. See, for us, that we get caught up in this body, this life, this time, and we think about the, the, the resurrection in temporal terms, and, and, and we can't, and Jesus is trying to do the same thing with them. You don't get it. You don't understand. This kingdom of heaven that we're trying to build, and this eternal life, and this place that I'm going to go and prepare a place for you, is something like you've never seen before. And people there aren't given in marriage. There's no need to procreate. They're not, they don't marry and give in marriage and there's other things that go along with them. And so what Jesus is telling them, what, marriage is not count anymore? Is that what he's saying? Or is he saying things are so much different there that you don't, that, that it's incomprehensible to where you are. Time means nothing. So if you didn't measure stuff by time, if you took away any aspect of time, what would change for you in the kingdom of heaven, this kingdom, um, this resurrection that's going to happen? Try to explain that. Because it would be like you're, you're telling this child right here, or this, this embryo, this fetus, this, this unborn, and say, you don't understand this right now, but one of these days, you know, that, I don't have, that you, you'll know about quantum physics, and, uh, and you'll know about uh, uh, astral projection, and we'll be able to tell you the mysteries of the universe, and you'll get it and stuff. But when that mother gives that last push that sends this young man out into the world, do you think this child has any idea, sitting in this situation right here, of what's to come? That's how ignorant we are about what is coming along. See, we think we know, but we don't know anything. And can you imagine Jesus trying to explain something to finite humans about the kingdom of heaven, about God's plan of salvation, about what majesty and, and, and incredulous things that are going to come upon you when this is what we know. We don't know. Jesus goes on to tell them exactly this right here. The reason is, is because Look at the resurrection this way. You read the book already. Moses, you know about the story there, and you're trying to tell me that Moses, you know, that if we follow the Mosaic line, line of thought long enough, we'll see just how absurd this resurrection is, and Jesus tells him, the problem is you're looking at time differently. That the Bible, that the Torah that you're reading says that God is the God of the living, not the dead. These people that are no longer here and have been gone for hundreds of years, they're still here. They're with it. God's with them. They're still, God is. It's, God is still their God. And if they're dead and in the ground, what difference would it make to them? You're, you're reading it wrong. Sometimes we think that we have all the answers and everything figured out and, and our ideas of eternity, and we get so confused with the idea of immortality and resurrection. What did we just profess right before we did it? We, read, we said we believe in the... The last thing before and life everlasting, the resurrection of the body. We have to be careful because there's a lot of stuff that goes on with this. I know that, that some people really get anxious over the fact that, that of when the resurrection happens is and, and uh, God, Christ coming back to, to rapture his church is going to be uh, before the thousand year tribulation, will be after the thousand year tribulation. And Jesus is trying to tell the people that are there, prepare your hearts and you won't have to worry about that. If, you're, if your heart is in the right place, if you're about the Father's business, then none of that's going to matter. And you don't have to worry about being given in marriage and, and whether that is so important to you now because things are going to be so radically different, you cannot even conceive what is in store for you when you get there. And you're going to be more surprised by the people that, aren't, that are there that aren't there. That's a hard one to get past for a lot of folks. 
Because when we think about this, this passage and what it means in resurrection and forgiveness of sins and, and who is there, who isn't, you know, my mind as I walk, I start considering the possibilities. What are the possibilities of all this? And I think about this, that, that Jesus is telling them that, that these three Jews are with him, with God right now. And I think, well, where's that going? And then my mind says, well, what does that mean? I thought that we got to square this up with the Christ event and all this kind of stuff. You mean there's something special that happens there? And if it's for them, is it for other people too as well? And so we start asking, who's in the kingdom and who's out of the kingdom? And then we start thinking about, there's no more marriage. There's no more, we may, we're not married and given in marriage. Relationships, the way that you and I know of them now, are no longer the same. No longer the same. I can imagine that, that ain't, you know, anxiety would happen because people like, you know, my parents that were remarried, that they, you know, had found marriage somewhere else again. Now, how are you going to square this up? Well, I don't know. Maybe I won't be in heaven, you know, have an answer to that, you know? It's not going to matter because your association with God is going to change. The relationships that we have with each other, the relationships that we have with God are going to be so radically different that we're going to be just like that baby in, in the womb. Wow. There's a world out there. A big world out there. I thought it was just like right here. I mean, it was always this space. That's all I got. You know? There's a world out there. And this kingdom that we're headed for is greater than anything that you know of. 